Hello and welcome to Without Edges, where we have conversations with people doing amazing things. And today my guest is someone pretty much everybody in real estate will know, not only just in Australia, but around the world. He is an author, a speaker, a communications coach, a TEDx speaker, a podcaster, and a wonderful human. Welcome, my friend, Mr. Rick Rushton. Sadi, I'm going to take you around the world and have you introduce me everywhere. It's always Absolutely. as good as it gets whenever I get introduced by you. My pleasure to be with you. How are you? I'm as well as you can do, I think, given that, you know, a day in Zoom feels like a week in the real world, doesn't it? So our whole world's kind of been sped up a little bit, I think, over the last, uh, what's that now, six to eight weeks. So uh, like everybody, I'm, I'm finding the opportunity and the difficulty and just uh, hopefully relying upon some uh, pretty strong mindset beliefs and some pretty strong values and seeing if I can live to them. It's a good time to learn whether or not what you think your life was based on is based on stuff that's going to get you through all challenging times as well as the good stuff, right? Well, that's what I want to start with you, Jay. I've got a lot to talk to you about, but I want to start with, you know, mid-March 2020. Yep. The world changed for everybody. And we started to use terminology like social distancing and lockdowns and, you know, global pandemics and the new normal. So how's your new normal going? And what does your new normal look like for you right now? Well, my new normal is that my commute from my bed to my ensuite to my coffee machine to my study is all around about under 50 paces where it used to be, uh, you know, early mornings getting to the airport, fighting maybe peak hour traffic, you know, business lounge breakfasts, flying somewhere, speaking, you know, flying on to somewhere else. And so, you know, a lot of it's done virtual now, but it's mm -hmm. still very much the case. I've been really, really fortunate, Sadi, that... I've been able to keep some pretty strong connections with some people that have, uh, you know, date back, you know, two and three decades, really. And so um, once this whole world shifted dramatically and we went from, you know, a bit of a, what is this thing called COVID-19 and then it's like shut down, lockdown, call it whatever you want. Um, I think a lot of people realised fairly quickly this was the time to probably have a, a third party voice speaking to their teams to just sort of say, what is the way forward here? Because it's like no leader could pull out the old COVID-19 manual and go, oh, this is what we do in this sort of situation. It was really pretty much a lot of stuff was policy on the run, a lot of thinking on the run. And so I've been really <laughs> fortunate to a degree. I mean, all the big events were gone. I, you know, I was, think I was booked for, I don't know, six or seven sort of platform gigs that just weren't going to go ahead, obviously. And um, But having said that, I've just spent a lot of time, you know, talking to people either one at a time on this platform, Zoom, or, you know, to groups in rooms, uh, depending on the size of the uh, organisation or having people zooming in from all over the place into that one sort of session. So for me, the uh, this way forward will be part what I keep and, and I'll, I'll, I don't just want to get through this thing I want to take from it, take what are the lessons from this and see if we can bring that in the, in the play. But fortunately for me, with my coaching clients across Australia, New Zealand, the UK, the US, a lot of my time was spent on Zoom pre-COVID-19. So yeah. I want to say a lot of, I think I've been using it for a year and a half, maybe two years. So um, it, was a, it was a platform I liked and knew and, and could run with it. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time. There's no doubt about that. So I don't know about you, but I, I actually stopped watching the news. Um, I only watch it once a day or I listen to it on the radio. And, and one of the reasons why I did that was because it was the same, you know, people dying, mass graves, uh, blame game, political unrest. You know, now you've got rights uh, in America, you've got rights in the UK. And you kind of got to wonder, well, you know, how lucky are we? Hopefully it doesn't filter through to here. I want to talk to you about the negativity that is around because as much as, as leaders we try and focus on the positive and, and there is a lot to be positive about, there's also a lot of negativity around. So how do we, how do we manage that negativity um, that is around us right now? Well, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, new services are interesting at the moment. You know, you've got 86,400 seconds in the day. I invest about 120 of those in the AM and about 120 of those in the PM. And I just get what I need to know about this particular challenge. Not just, you know, not just COVID-19, but just anything to do with uh, news, realistically. I mean, I know a lot of people say, I don't watch the news, but I think you have to be sort of in touch, but out of reach, you know, be in touch with information, but out of reach of the, of the grab for that. Because I think we are wired up to go searching, not so much what we want, but normally what we expect. If we're expecting negativity, we seem to find it everywhere. So, um, you know, what I tend to do is I, I, I tend to wake up with, uh, and I think I shared this with uh, a group with your sort of Harcourts leaders um, last week, but I tend to wake up the same way 
pre-COVID-19 and I'm pretty sure I'll keep on waking up this way till I no longer wake up. And that's, I always wake up with, with what I'm grateful for, F-O-U-R. And I think about the four things I'm grateful for and what does that mean to me and what does that look like? And more importantly, how does that sort of shape my thinking for the day? It's almost impossible to wake up and say, I'm grateful for these things. You know, waking up in Australia, I'd rather wake up here than any other country on the planet at the moment. You know, waking up next to the love of a great woman for, you know, since 1983 and, you know, waking up to three healthy children and waking up to the possibilities to help people get to a better place today. And it used to be for a fair chunk of my professional career as a real estate agent and then as a, a leader and then as a, a business owner and then, you know, as a trainer and all those sorts of things. But now it's helping people get to a better place in their mindset and just be aware that, you know, we can be informed but not alarmed. This storm of COVID-19 has blown on every one of us. You know, no one's missed it. You know, we're all in the same storm. We're just in different boats and how we route the sail and how we choose to use that wind is really probably the key for me. So the winds of negativity, Sadi, that's blowing a lot of people to that harbour of, you know, fear and, you know, negativity and adversity and challenge and stress and depression is the same wind that's blowing other people to, I didn't know this about me. I've just found another gear I didn't even know I had. I found a, a new innovative way to keep in touch with people. And, you know, so a lot of people have used the same winds. They're just kind of set a bit better sail if that's the right terminology to use and that's you know, something I learned from Jim Rohn back you know the early 90s about the, your, your personal philosophy and allowing negativity in is a bit like the set of a sail you've just set the sail in the wrong setup and you know, it's not to say be ignorant to the negativity I mean how would you know what light was if you didn't know what darkness was how would you know what great was if you didn't know what poor was so I need to know what's going on I'm not one who likes putting my head in the sand and just saying I just don't watch the news and I don't look at news I think news is important uh, but be very careful where you're getting that source from. And I think about 120 seconds in the AM and 120 seconds in the PM is enough. And then from there, you just form your own opinions. And, you know, we are a little bit selfish in moments like this. Yeah, you know, my wife is healthy, my children are healthy, and then I just keep working out from the food chain from there. Oh. And so I think, we take, I think we take it really from our own setup and our own mindset. And it's not those conditions of COVID-19, but the decisions we make around that that determines whether or not We've got a positive or negative mindset in my humble. Mm. Now, the mental health areas, I know that you are quite heavily involved in. I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you recently, um, I think it was on Facebook other, that I saw you coming out and saying, you know, we really need to change some of our terminology in this space. Tell me about the words that we have been using and what we should change them to and why. Well, it's a great sort of discussion that we're just not having at the moment in Australia, or dare I say it, probably globally, Sadi. I mean, what we know, pre-COVID-19, eight Australians didn't make the day. They didn't, they just took their own lives. Mm. That means there are eight families that woke up without a mother or a father or a brother or a sister or a grandfather or a grandparent. You know, there is so much tragedy out there around that emotional well-being space, as we like to call it, not the mental health space. Now, I can't take credit for that. That's two amazing gentlemen by the name of Wayne Schwass, former AFL great and now media personality and co-founder of a great organisation called Pucker Up, and Nick Brax, son of former Premier Steve Brax, who together we've been able to do a lot of great work bringing this real challenge to light. And, you know, if we woke up tomorrow morning, Sadi, and found out that, you know, eight people had died on our state roads overnight, there'd be an outcry. Yet... That was the numbers pre-COVID-19. Does anyone doubt that those numbers have increased during, again, home um, isolation, if you will, and you know, what was that sort of um, you know, social distancing? I mean, even that terminology is poor. Personal space would have been better, but social distancing, it's almost our governments have said, go and be alone with your thoughts that are negative, with your thoughts that are dark, with your thoughts that say, I probably have no solutions here, with your thoughts that I'm probably better off dead than alive, how scary is that? So even in the media, it's branded as mental health. That has a stigma attached to it. Emotional well-being are two words that I think change worlds. And I've got first-hand evidence of it from people I know and love who have said, just changing the narrative from mental health to emotional well-being gives me the space to have the conversation with you. And I've found, Sadi, that just listening without judgment, listening without trying to solve, just listening, just being an ear, is something that probably can shift the thinking of the individual is thinking I've got nothing left to give to maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel and I'll now pursue that. So I'm a big believer that words change worlds and how we pre-frame a lot of stuff dictates the conversations we have firstly with ourselves, secondly with those that we know and love. And the biggest challenge around that sort of space is 
It's the people who are less likely that you would think from the outside looking in, this person looks like she's got it all under control and she's fantastic. Yet, you know, and, and the scary thing for me is they're the ones who are calling me offline or having private conversations with me saying, you know, I, I just, I'm questioning whether it's what it's all about and whether I've got anything of value to bring and I'm better off dead. And I'm going, man, this is the same person I see light up a stage or light up a room the minute they come in and, yeah, many of the best coaches in the world are some of the most messed up people, Sadie. So, you know, and uh, and I, I don't for any one moment in time think I've got it totally under control. But that conversation is conversation as leaders specifically in this time. I've got to tell you, the numbers just don't lie. I've been in rooms and audiences where I go, raise your hand if you know someone who's dealing with emotional well-being challenges. And I can be in a room of a few people or a few hundred people or a few thousand people. And the majority of the hands that go up is very frightening. Mm. So it's conversations we've got to have. And I think it starts with ourselves, you know, how are we doing? And, and more importantly, are you okay with our sphere and our friends? And, you know, so as leaders, I've been coaching leaders in this day and age, not to check up on their people, but check in with them. If you're checking up, you're saying, I don't trust you by default. Yeah. If you're checking in with them, you're saying, how are you doing, by the way? <laughs> more importantly, it's that like, that's kind of the fundamental um, discussion point. So I think that narrative needs to change. And it's, again, it's not me coming up with that. It's me, uh, I guess, just picking up the, the the pieces that have been laid down by Wayne and Nick and other people in that great space. And I spent some days on the phones at Lifeline and stuff like that over the last month or so. And it's really quite, quite, um, I guess, confronting to be mm. brutal honest because you just don't expect. And, and it's okay not to have all the answers, just like leaders at the moment, they have all the answers. Mm. But the best way to lead at the moment is to be authentic the best way to be involved with someone who's going through a tough time is to say hey, i don't have all the answers i'm happy to listen and i'm happy to explore them with you and i think together we're going to find the solution if we want to mm. but yeah no no want on the part of the person who's healthy and fine is going to help those that are challenged with this and that's yeah. where there's probably a disconnect if the truth be yeah. And I think and all those organisations you've mentioned are under enormous pressure, but still doing a great job in, in taking the course. And I do want to say here right now that if there is anybody feeling the way that you've just described, that it's important they reach out to someone who they trust who can help them or to many organisations out there. But I think um, your point around leaders is interesting, isn't it? Because at this point in time, we're sort of seven, eight weeks in. Uh, some of us still have teams working remotely. We're doing rotations or, you know, lucky enough to be back in the office. But this all has an impact on people. All of this, the eight weeks, the next three months, four months, six months, will all have an impact on people. And I think right now as leaders, one of our biggest, most important focus has to be our people and talking to them. But more importantly, I think being really observant on exactly how they are feeling and behaving because it's in those observations that you might notice the smallest of changes that may prevent something much bigger happening. Do you agree with that? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if I saw you and hadn't seen you for a while and you had a plaster cast around your right wrist, I'd say, oh, sorry, you've got a broken wrist. Mm -hmm. But you don't come into my space and I don't come into your space with a plaster cast around my head. So, you know, and sometimes, again, the, the real challenge with this, I call it an absolute disease because it really is a disease that should be treated like it. You know, I mean, I think Australia's got 0.14% of a percent of, you know, COVID-19 sort of people with it. I mean, that's not a pandemic by any stretch if you really measure it against the eight people a day taking their own lives by suicide. And the scary stat on top of that, Saad, is that 75% fail. So God knows what that number could really look like. And again, as you said earlier, if anyone's, dealing with that 13 11 14 is a great number to keep in the back of your mind 13 14 11 we better get that right but for lifeline but my message there is is that you know effectively people won't necessarily lead off with i'm not doing so okay but it, it does come from questioning and so i think a lot of it is about how you're doing yeah i'm doing great now how are you really doing i just found going twice on the same question doubling down on it sadi is a very good way of doing it you know how are you doing yeah, I'm okay. How are you really doing? What are you really doing? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not too sure. Talk to me about that. Yeah, yeah like just dig deeper. And, and, and again, if you want better results with your people, you've got to ask better questions. You can't just get through the usual, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. New year, great. No problems. Especially not males. Males don't say, hey, Jim, can I just grab you for 30 seconds and talk to you about some stressful moments I've got in my life at the moment? It doesn't seem to be that macho male image. As I was a young man growing up, 
you know, and my hero then is still my hero today. My brother who predates me by six years, he's six foot three, he's my height across his shoulders. He's been in the Victoria Police Force since 1978. He's been in the SOG. Those guys are just freaks. They pump weights and they just kill people and, you know, protect us and all those sorts of things. If I ever said to him, I'm not doing well emotionally, I think he'd tell me to man up. No fault of his, that's just how he's wired up. But I think this next generation of Australians is saying we're more in touch with who we are emotively. So as leaders, we have to be in tune to that and make sure that we're having the right conversations. Not small talk, Sadi, big conversations. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you really doing? Well, I could be doing better. When you say better, how do you mean specifically? Just keep digging. Just keep digging. And then something will come up. And like, look, I feel uncomfortable sharing this with you, but I feel a little bit uneat. Great. Let's have the conversation. Not great that you're having it, but let's have the conversation now. So, you know, once the walls come down, it's amazing what comes out. And you just got to be there as a leader to, you know, if, we've said for such a long time, haven't we, that uh, people are our business. And, you know, your organisation is an amazing one because one of its values is people first. So we're seeing how true those organisations are at the moment about whether they are living their values or are they just, uh, you know, words on a wall that don't really mean too much, but they look fancy in our, um, in our waiting rooms, but does that actually suggest that this is who we are as an organisation and who we are as leaders? But I think at the moment, that ability to really check in with your people as opposed to checking up on them, mm-hmm. even that starts off a totally different sort of narrative. You know, I'm just mm-hmm. checking in. How are you doing? Is everything okay? You know, how can I help? And, uh, and, and not losing sight of the fact that leaders don't, they're not immune to this. Sometimes the best bloody leaders are the ones who are struggling the most with this as well. But I think if you have that sort of mindset going in with these discussions about having open conversations, really big open conversations, Sadi, that, that, that gives you the best chance, I think, to see if you can be of service to that particular individual. Mm. That number is 13, 11, 14 for Lifeline. 13, 11, 14, yes. 13, 11, 14, I'll just mention that one again. Um, I want to switch to the, to the leadership perspective because... Um, you know, a lot of leaders at the moment are juggling, uh, so they've got their own family life, then they've got a, a business now, so businesses may have been impacted mildly, you know, quite badly, businesses may have closed down, um, they're having to reduce staff numbers, they're having to ask staff to take pay cuts or reduce their hours, and that all brings an enormous added pressure to leaders. Where do they go? Because I think you know, that's great that we can look after our employees, but when all the burden comes on that one person at business, I need to be able to go somewhere. So where do we go as leaders? So it's a great question. And, you know, a lot of leaders that I'm coaching and, um, you know, what I've done is I've peered them up a little bit so they can have conversations that outlast the half hour I'm on a Zoom with them a week or the hour that I might be with them every 21 days. I actually peer them up with like-minded people who do have the ability to be there when I'm on another Zoom with somebody else. And I think leaders at the moment, no one's ever got on their own without the help of others. So there's no successful hermits, Sata. I believe that. So, you know, success is not a solo performance. So any leader worth their salt who's got anywhere in the game of life has got there standing on the shoulders of giants before them who they can go back to and put their hand up and say, hey, I'm not going so great in this area or this is unprecedented times and those sorts of things. I had a really good conversation with Dr. Dennis Waitley, one of the last real greats of that sort of genre of, you know, powerful personal development icons from the seventies and the eighties. And, you know, he's in his nineties now and we did a really cool sort of session and it was just so great to talk to him. And he said, the challenges today were always there, but they're just, they come repackaged from time to time. But he said, what leaders absolutely thrive on leaders thrive on control and it's very hard to control something that they have no control over to a degree but Mm -hmm. life is uncontrollable at best so he said you know one of the things you've got to be doing as a leader is being authentically you saying um you know i I might need a bit of help here and you can go back to uh, some some mentors and just maybe sound them out sadi we're we're really lucky you and i because we know so many people after 30 odd years in the business It's very yeah. easy to go. And, you know, you work for an amazing organisation. I'd be, I'd be thinking about, you know, similar peers in the Harcourts group that I could have a real chat to. And if there's one thing about your organisation that absolutely stands out from the inside out and from the outside looking in is your culture is very much that people first and having the ability to 
you know, have a sounding board like Mike and Irene or having a sounding board like many of you, having you, I think would be a, an interesting sounding board. And, you know, I've, I've never leaned on you anywhere near as much as I should have potentially over some of the challenges I've had. And you're someone who's popping into my mind a lot lately. So yeah, I'll be, don't, don't think I won't be taking that up going forward. So I think the simple message is leaders got there uh, with the help of others. Who are, who were those others? If they're still around, connect with them. Even if they're not still around, they're probably around in a book or they're around in a, you know, a tape, cassette tape or a, you know, a TED talk or something. And so, you know, I find myself quoting the late great Jim Rohn more often than not now. And, you know, he's, he hasn't been with us for 11 years, you know, but uh, I, I find myself, and it's really funny, Sadi, because so many people will send me inbox flood messages going, look at this guy on you know, LinkedIn or look at this gal on Facebook and they're quoting all this stuff that I go, you know, I don't care how they're quoting old fundamentals, just get it out there. I mean, you and I are lucky because we've been exposed to a lot of this stuff from a long time ago. But, you know, I even saw something on uh, social media the other day about the big rocks going into a jar first. I'm thinking, gosh, I think I heard that in 1988, but I don't care if someone's hearing it for the first time in 2020. Yeah. It's a principle that works. Put the big rocks in first. What are the big rocks? And this business yeah. isn't your life. It just funds your lifestyle. Now, as a leader, it's okay to not be okay. It's mm. okay not to have all the answers. Mm. But let's lean on the same people who boosted us up earlier, our mentors, and have a chat to them. Or lean on a peer. I mean, you know, for me, it's really cool to speak to you. You know, I've got some really good friends in the speaking coaching business, whether that be, you know, the Tangerlees of this world, whether that be, you know, more of the current sort of folk that are out there, or even some of the, uh, dare I say, some of the veterans. And, you know, like I've been chatting this week with David Knox and, you know, I've, I've had some great conversations with some pretty good leaders going, here's what I'm thinking, how does that shape with what you know and what you believe? And is there anything in the past that you think is very relevant for now? Because there are no new fundamentals, they're just old Cokes served up in shiny new Pepsi Max cans. So how do we do that in this modern day and age? So I think leaders just need to go back to who helped them get where they got. And if they can still do it in person, you're fortunate. If you can't, review the book, you know, review yeah. the tape, review the video. Review well, I'm going to I'm going to dob both of us in, Rick, because this this is going out the whole industry and beyond. So if anybody needs to reach out, and you and I will be available to anybody who picks up the phone to us. Um, I can guarantee that's the case. If uh, if uh, if I can help in any way, I'm I, you know I've been a servant leader. I think for was it now 27 years, and I'll continue to do it till I can't do it anymore, Sadi. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. Mm. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I have a business plan every year and I, you've heard me talk before and I put it on my shower wall and I, you know, I'm a tick, like done that high five at the end of the year. And, you know, my goals went up on my wall on the 1st of January in my shower and I looked at it the other day and I went, oh my God, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this was, I was one of those people who went, I hated 2019. It was the shittest year of my life. You know, it was like, thank God it's gone on New Year's Eve. And now I'm like, can I just go back there? Because that was awesome. So for those of us who are now sitting here with this beautiful business plan that was supposed to be 2020, what are you suggesting the people you work with? Do you just kind of write the whole thing off or do you take elements of it, adjust it and go again? What are you suggesting to people? Well, it clearly needs to be edited. There's no doubt about that. Clearly, yes. Yeah. Anything anyone says other than that, you know, is just off in la la land. But I think what I don't like hearing is people going, "I just I'm writing off 2020 and I want a fresh start in 2021." There are still, best I can tell, six months mm. to make a significant difference in 2020. So I don't subscribe to them. I'm just going to wipe the whole thing off. My business plan is a little bit different. So I've got a life plan. So I'm very clear on why I do what I do. And I know my why. And I knew it way before Simon Sinek had that beautiful TED Talk and book about it. It's something that's always driven me because in life, what we know is reasons come first and answers come second. If you find enough reasons, you'll find enough answers to almost do anything. If you're committed to it, you'd find a way. If you're, if you're, if you're interested in it, you'll find an excuse as to why it didn't happen. So I don't have the numerical must make this amount of income per year, but I am aware of the number I'm chasing from an economic standpoint. Now that's been adjusted and I have to adjust that. Mm -hmm. But I know why I do what I do. I know what I value. When your values are clear, decisions are very easy to make. And so therefore someone says, can we catch up for a Zoom conference? And my name is Sardana Smiles. I say, very easy to say yes to that because I know what I value, I know what you value. Um, so it's a very easy conversation to have. So I know why I do what I do. I know my values and what I'm, 
what I'm absolutely committed to achieving. And I know, I guess my core purpose, if you want to call it that, and I know if I help enough people get what they want, the old corny saying is very true, but it's the old Zig Ziglar. If I help enough people get what they want, I can get everything I need and want. So, you know, I'm, I'm not so much looking at the economics. I can tell you how much money I've lost. I can describe it to <laughs> the last letter, but I don't really spend a lot of my time in the rear vision mirror. I'm still looking at the windscreen moving forward. And, um, you know, so uh, economically, we, we, we've done okay in the past as a family. And so, you know, we, we don't sort of sit there wondering where our next meal is coming from. And, and I don't make a lot of that because there are people that do and mm. that's really challenging. But so I think my message to everybody is, yeah, definitely edit the business plan. But I think what this last six to eight weeks has shown us is what we truly value, you know? And so we thought it was the deal and the numbers and all those sorts of things. What we really value is the connections and that sort of ability to hug someone and, you know, that interaction. Cause we've gone from this virtual world now to starting to have a little bit of interaction again. And my gut feeling is people that have been in this high tech world are very much craving for the high touch going forward. So um, I think the business plan, you know, numbers will take care of themselves a little bit to a degree. I don't subscribe to these numbers that are floating out there. I think, uh, Hobart went up 1%. Um, uh, Melbourne came back not even 1%. Um, now, I don't know across all of Australasia yet, but you know, there's nothing like the 20 or 30% that people are saying. So I, I suspect our businesses can be adjusting and pivoting pretty quickly. Um, you know, the gut feeling is, is that it's not a case of how many transactions. I think the volumes are down, but what we've got to do is add more value. So if we, the best job keeper I think we can give ourselves is to become more valuable. And if we're more valuable, by adding more value, then we've probably kept our jobs to a degree. Have we had a pay cut? Absolutely. Small price to pay to live really in a pretty safe environment. Mm -hmm. And you know, what have we got now? 103 deaths. That's 103 yeah. too many. But I stack that up against over 100,000 in the US. I stack that up against every other country in Europe. I think our plans just need a slight editing, but what a good opportunity that is, right? And really making sure that we understand that this business isn't our life, it just funds our lifestyle. So. Yeah. Maybe we've got to come back with the lifestyle a little bit too. Maybe the third car doesn't need to be there. Maybe a lot of the things that we thought we needed need to be reined in a little bit too. And, you know, I've got to tell you, the most disappointing person when this thing gets back to normal is going to be our 10-year-old uh, English staffy who loves going for a walk every day. But in the recent times, we had to say goodbye to an 18-year-old dog who we love. And I've got to tell you, you know, my kids aren't worrying about their jobs at the moment and uh, anything like that. They're just worried about whether or not they've absolutely got aligned with who they are and what they value. And I think for 28 and 26 year olds to come up with that concept is something that tells me that COVID-19 has been a very, very, very poorly wrapped gift. We want to look at it that way. So, and not making a lot of anyone who's lost family members from it or anything along those lines. You and I have a very close friend in Paul McGee and he had COVID-19. And um, yeah, when I found that out and he was the first real close person I knew that had it. So, um, but that would be my message, edit the business plan and just really make sure that you are very clear on what you value and why you're doing what you're doing. If you've got those two things right, you know, money isn't everything, but it's right there with oxygen, as the great Zig Ziglar once said. But also at the end of the day, I think most people would go with a little less more money for a lot more interaction, human interaction moving mm. forward. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to reset and review and refocus. In, in my own business, you can't see my office, but in my own business, I've just got this whole list going of, you know, what I'm going to keep. So, you know, we've had to make changes to the business, um, you know, as many of people have, but, but it's the lessons that I'm learning and what am I going to keep and what am I going to let go of? Because what I don't want to happen is go back to what I was doing eight weeks ago. And it's something that you said, you know, lessons that you've, that you've learned that are going to move you forward. Whereas what I'm worried about is that how many of us will go back to the comfort zone, whereas we've got a wonderful opportunity now to actually we've pivoted we've moved forward but how do we now keep moving forward i think is our biggest challenge in business well that's the narrative that unfortunately our politicians probably pre-framed a little bit and whether you're left or right of politics is irrelevant i think every political leader's done the best job they've known how to do but when they've talked about this we will get through this we will get through this everyone's just focused on getting through it i think we've got to focus on getting from it what can we mm. learn from this mm. what, let's bring the best of us with us through the other side of this to make sure that what we've learned during these times of challenge, struggle, you know, fear, scarcity, you know, what we've learned is the value of toilet paper went up pretty quickly and then it went down again pretty quickly as well, didn't it? So what did we learn about that? Was that, was that a real scarcity or was that scarcity? I don't know. But, you know, my message here is 
make sure that you take the best from this experience and add it to what you already know, who you are doesn't really change, but how you operate changes dramatically because what we, what we do know is that, you know, life is a really, I've got no doubts. Yeah. This has been seen as a once in a lifetime event. We'll have a few more of these before we're finished, God willing. And so, you know, I think this will be the new norm. If you think about the summer, I mean, it's almost been forgotten how terrible it was in Australia from effectively uh, well, New Year's was horrific, wasn't it? Um, and I feel just so gutted for those individuals that have gone through fires, still can't even start rebuilding yet, and that may have lost loved ones with COVID-19, may have definitely lost their jobs. So you know, I just think um, you know, you've got to have gratitude. That's why I wake up to four things I'm thankful for, and it's very hard from there to let negativity get in. Mm. It's important to be aware of it, but not, uh, not allowing it to consume you, I think, is the answer. Do you have rituals that you do religiously every day? Rick, because I'm finding that that is one of the things that is getting me through the day in and day out of some of what can be a grind is the rituals that I have. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely do. And I think we all do, whether we know it consciously or subconsciously, I don't know. But, you know, certainly routine sets me free. So I'm very aware of how I go about. Uh, I definitely don't lift my head off the pillow without just saying that thing I said to you before. What am I thankful for? If you are and I, I mentally look at it and I picture it and then I, I go, OK. And then I, I, I always tend to start just before I drop off to sleep. I grab my journal and I will jot stuff down that just dumps down on it so that I can go to sleep. It frustrates the life out of my wife that I can hit the pillow and go bang. Um, but I've dumped everything out that I want. And then, so the first thing I view, which is typically on my nightstand, I just view, ah, this is the opportunity today. So straight away, my mind goes straight there to what's, what's, what's a great attraction opportunity for me to a degree. So my rituals are pretty well ingrained and, um, you know, but I don't, I, I don't go through sort of personal chance. I I'm not right into that sort of stuff to be brutally honest. I don't know, some people love meditating. I like exercising. It could be a meditation. I don't know. I love music. I sing poorly, although in the shower I sound like a rock star. Um, I've got the rituals. There's no doubt about that. But I, I don't think it's my job to pass my rituals on to the next person because I think it's a bit like spirituality. It's very individual. It's very mm. specific. And so I just absolutely love the fact that, you know, you've got to find what sets you up for success. And, you know, um, I love sort of, you know, Tom Ferry's Take Your Meds you know, which is med meditation, you know, exercise, diet and sleep. And I get that. Um, but, you know, I think we've got to be realists as well. Uh, life is not going to change for us post COVID-19 because of cliches. It's certainly not going to change for us because of quotes. It's going to change for us from what the actions we're going to take from this are going to look like, sound like, feel like an R. And, you know, Jim Rohn used to talk about affirmations without action is the start of delusion. He said, if you, if you, the best thing to chant is, you know, just chant the truth. If you're broke, just say, I'm broke, chant that. You know, if you're uncertain, just chant, I'm uncertain, chant that too. But my view is if you, if you have four things you're, you're absolutely thankful for and you've got gratitude, if you've got gratitude, you've got wealth beyond measure. So mm -hmm. start off with that and you'll be fine. And then whether you're a meditator, whether you're a stretcher, whether you're an exerciser, whether you're, a, you know, whether you're someone who just gets straight into it, find what works for you. But routine definitely sets me free. And it's something I'm, I, I, I'm a journaler, so I, I write a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't hit the keyboard as much. I mean, all my uh, high-tech devices are, are voice recognition, so I type by talking. So I like to write stuff down, Sadi. I just find the connection of you know, my thoughts to a pen, to a piece of paper, that really does it for me. So you know, I wrote a book um, freehand, realistically. I had to get it typed out. Um, that's how I kind of... That's how I kind of conceptually, that's how I learnt as a kid. You know, you hear a teacher say something, you jot it down. You and I have gone to that many seminars, we've probably forgotten how many we've gone to. I'll, I'll hear a good quote, I'll jot it down. I'll hear a great strategy, I'll jot it down. You know, my mentor, the late, great Jim Rohn, used to always say, jot this down. So I did. You know, it's kind of reflex action for me now. So maybe that's a routine too. But my message is, find one that serves you. Don't be a poor imitation of someone who's telling you this is what you should be doing. Cause what it's not one size fits all. We are, if we were all the same, there'd be one TV station, one radio station, there'd be a 10 cinema complex playing the same movie in 10 cinemas, but it's not. There are some people who get jazzed by music. There are other people who love the solitude and the quiet and getting into the gap. You just find what serves you. You'll know it serves you because it's rewarding you or telling you, no, that doesn't make sense to me. And so just find what serves you and get it into, just schedule it, just schedule it and smash it out. That, that, that would be my tip. I think that one of the things you said to our group the other day was that, you know, punch the day in the face. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've actually written it down for myself. It's like, you know, yeah, I need to get up and punch the day in the face. And that could be any way you choose to do it. 
but I, I did like that analogy that you used with our group the other day, which was just to punch it in the face. Punch it in the face, just be proactive, you know, before it punches you in the face, get, get a yeah. few away yourself. And then all of a sudden you can kind of, you know, ease into your day a little bit better. You know, there's 168 hours in the week. We're going to spend some of those sleeping. We're going to spend a lot of that producing. I don't think we want to spend too much of that worrying. And, you know, what I'm hearing about a lot of people, as I said to you earlier, Sadi, so many people have already given up on 2020. Um, I hear people go, shit, I'm having a bad day. Well, when you really drill it down, they had a bad moment, but they let, you know, 120 seconds, maybe two, two minutes affect the rest of their, their day. So I think you're, you're so switched on with your thoughts around have a routine, be very clear, uh, have a plan to work on whatever that looks like. And, you know, I do plan, but not to the nth degree. I'm not an Excel spreadsheet or I'm a keynote sort of, you know, love concepts and I love big thought bubbles and stuff of that nature, but just get, get what serves you and, and be open to all the learnings. You know, there's a really cool amount of information out there at the moment. You don't have to be in the new services to get it. I didn't realize how many real estate experts were medical practitioners until I went on social media after this pandemic came out. And I, you know, everyone's a coach in this day and age and God bless them. And I think there's 168 hours in the week and I reckon there's about 10,000 hours of podcasting if you really want to do it right now. So anyone who's watching this, I'm grateful for that opportunity. But I've got to tell you, you know, at some stage, you've just got to be very clear on why you're doing what you're doing, know what you want to do and get out and smash it. So Rick, where can we buy your book? In every good bookstore, I imagine. <laughs> and, pr and probably crap ones by now. I don't know. But uh, the, the, the Power of Connection is actually sold out. It's in its second print run. It got Amazing. repackaged as CRM, which I thought was really applicable for real estate agents, which is, you know, uh, connect, relate and motivate. It's the exact same book, Sadi. So it's, you know, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Booktopia. You can get the audible download of The Power of Connection. My view would be listen to it one and a half times because they made me speak very, very slowly when we recorded it. Uh, and you'll get through it quicker and uh, the concepts are, are pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, Amazon, Booktopia, uh, you, know, you can even email me at our website if you want one and we'll send it to you. It's not that hard to get realistically, but um, you know, in terms of, uh, that's not what today's about, by the way. Today's about really just having a no, cool no. I just, yeah, I just, I saw the books in the background. I just thought, oh, I'll just ask where they were. Uh, well, all I can tell you is, you know, coming on and having a chat, I feel better for this experience, which is kind of what we know. You teach it once and learn it, learn it twice, don't you? So all this stuff I'm, I'm hopefully sharing is the stuff I learned two, three decades ago, there is nothing new under the sun. Be very wary of someone who goes, I got up with this concept the other day and I'm coaching leaders at this stage or on this point or I'm coaching. Some of the best coaches we've got, so are you between the right ear and the left ear, right here. You already know, no one watching this or listening to this needs to know some magic bullet. You all know what to do. Just get in touch with who you are and get on with it. Are these the ideal conditions? Probably not if we go looking for the storm clouds. But are these the right opportunities to find out who we are, what we're about, who our friend in life? Sadi, we have so many acquaintances, very few true friends. True friends have checked in over this last six to eight weeks and gone, are you okay? Everything all right? Right? So just be very careful about, you know, allowing too much expectation out there from third parties who have never done it, never done it, trying to tell you how to do it. I think of your group, I think of so many, when I think of Martin, and I think of so many guns, guns who I could be just checking in with you don't need to go outside the four walls of the blue team they're all there so just check in with you check in with your teams you know rob Paul, you can get a nicer guy i mean for goodness sake um so just there's enough people enough resources reach out to them you don't need to go outside of that and uh, if i can help in any way um you know it's just my name at myname.com so it's just rick at rickrushton.com rick with no c r-i-k at r-i-k r-u-s-h-t-o-n.com and Email me and I'll get you wherever I can. I'm on all the socials. Not that I'm really on them, but uh, I think someone's on them for me. And uh, I'm happy to sort of, re, you know, re-continue the conversation if it needs to be done. And if anybody needs help, um, uh, going back to our earlier conversation, the lifeline number again is 13 11 14. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for you, fixing it up. I was getting a bit dyslexic. No, that's okay. I, I, um, I looked it up while you were talking, but it is important that if you are feeling overwhelmed or anxious in any way that you do reach out for help. So the lifeline number is 13 11 14. And Rick, help thank change you. the narrative. Help change the narrative. Yes. No more mental health. Let's, let's please start having conversations with our people about their emotional well-being thank you yes. so much beautiful lady no rick thank you so much always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, look after yourself and i look forward to actually physically being able to <laughs> <laughs> have a cup of coffee and, and give you a big hug my friend
Well, I'll be there with arms open and heart open and uh, can't wait for that either. So here's to everyone's continued success watching this, looking at this and stay safe, stay healthy, stay productive. Thank you. That was another episode of Without Edges. If you enjoy what you hear, please share it and let me know if you know of somebody doing amazing things you would like me to interview. Until next time, stay safe.